Theological Evolution Critique, Bias and Science. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique, um, and we're almost done with the scientific part of it. This is the last chapter. Um, before we begin, I will point out that uh, uh, there are several positions one can take in the creation-evolution controversy. There's what I would call young life creationism. There is what has traditionally been called old earth, but should be called old life creationism. There is a theistic evolution that is intelligent design friendly. Uh, there is a theistic evolution that is not intelligent design friendly. That is to say, it says that if you look at nature, you really can't tell that there's a God that's doing this. Um, and of course, then there's atheistic evolution. And those are kind of the options you have. This book is not aimed at atheistic evolution, although of course it does contain criticism of that. It is aimed specifically at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. There is a God, but he did it in such a way that you can't tell that atheistic evolutionists could be right for all we know, except that we have our theology that, that rules that out. This chapter is written by Christopher Shaw. Uh, it's uh, a part of part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution. It's officially in the case against universal common descent and for a common human origin, but it really kind of belongs to both sides of that chapter. It's kind of a conclusion uh, and kind of an introduction to the next chapter, which is on uh, philosophy. And it's entitled, Pressure to Conform Leads to Bias in Science. And that's why I've shortened it to Bias in Science. The summary is as follows. Science has become all pervasive in modern society and is regarded by many as the means to solve all our major problems. For many, science has become a new religion, endowed with an infallibility extending even to answering the fundamental questions about our origins and the purpose of our existence, questions that were once the subject matter of philosophers and religious scholars. As a consequence of this new role, the scientific process has become increasing, has excuse me, been increasingly departing from its objective basis to one of crash, crass subjectivity, with regular, highly speculative claims being made by renowned scientists in the popular media and even in the scientific press. Phrases such as I or we believe that have become common among sun scientists, particularly in the fields of evolutionary biology and cosmology. The high priests of this new religion, we'll call it scientism, are the worst offenders, and many have achieved international celebrity status. But there is also a largely unknown dark side to this new religion, control of the freedom of thought. As acknowledged by the majority of scientists, the allocation of research funding and the peer review system of scientific publications are both seriously flawed and serve to maintain the status quo within the establishment by filtering out perceived intellectual heretics. New thoughts, ideas, and insights are often viewed with suspicion and require evaluation not only of their worth, but also, increasingly, of their potential to challenge widely accepted dogma. Indeed, this has been an almost universal experience in the early ridicule fraught careers of most Nobel laureates in the sciences. New recruits to the system must obey the rules if they wish to maintain training positions, tenure, and career progression. So it's a problem that's not specific to intelligent design, although it fits it. Um, scientism, the new religion. Scientific advances in the past 200 years have been instrumental in producing rapid changes in virtually every aspect of life, particularly with regard to the global environmental changes associated with expanding human agriculture and industry required to feed and maintain a bur burgeoning human population. Science has produced numerous benefits for humanity in terms of technological innovations that have generated unprecedented advances in healthcare, nutrition, and telecommunications. Sciences have done well. 
the apparent solutions to many of life's problems and the relatively cozy lives of people in developed nations has led to the demise of tr traditional Christian beliefs and their replacement by the new religion of scientism. The rationale for this is simple. Why feel obliged to abide by the often inconvenient and lifestyle intruding rules of a superior being, a creator God, when science is solving all our problems? And it's much more fun to ignore it. The Church of Scientism has its anti-theist prophets and priesthood who pervade almost all aspects of modern life and who pursue this new religion with an almost unequaled evangelistic zeal, beginning in our schools and continuing into higher education. Those who do not convert but maintain their biblical beliefs are often subjected to name-calling, usually with an implication of low intelligence and often dishonesty. That's my own ad, uh, added. Increasingly, as we have, shall see, the same strategies used for scientists who challenge the accepted scientific dogma of the establishment and not just in intelligent design. Basically, the Catechism of Scientism states that the universe and life arose through cosmic accidents over long, vast periods of time and that, therefore, our human existence has no defined purpose. Individuals are free to do as they please. And stop that for a minute. Did you notice that? arose through cosmic accidents over vast periods of time. We weren't going to be attacking the time frame, right? Oops. Move on. Uh, individuals are free to do as they please, as there is no rational scientific basis for moral concepts such as good and bad. We are told that we are not alone in the universe and that indeed many universes may exist, of which ours is only one. These dogmas are not, as one would expect, based on scientific proof in the form of reproducible and experimental evidence, but rather are based on speculation or individual beliefs. Stephen Hawking, quoted in the Mail Online in an article entitled New Hunt for Alien Life, said, we believe, this is emphasis supplied, of course, that life arose spontaneously on Earth. So in an infinite universe, there must be Occur other occurrences of life. Somewhere in the cosmos, perhaps intelligent life may be watching these lights of ours, aware of what they mean. Or do our lights wander a lifeless cosmos, unseen beacons announcing that here on one rock, the universe discovered its existence? Either way, there is no bigger question. We must know. Such statements would not be considered scientific and are more consistent with a religious belief system, but being uttered by one of the most high-profile scientists of our time, they are taken by the general public as factual and true. Such subjective commentaries from eminent scientists are now commonplace, and many, especially the young, are being subconsciously initiated into the new religion. Evolutionary theory was one of the first areas of science to travel this path, and any alternative explanations or beliefs concerning life's origins or diversity are treated as heresies in the vast majority of schools. Deviation from this establishment dogma by teachers can result, and indeed has resulted, in litigation or dismissal from employment. Among his great scientific achievements, Craig Venter, an entrepreneurial molecular biologist, suggested it, uh, succeeded in making the first synthetic bacterial cell, which he named Cynthia. Uh, many scientists and non-scientists claim that Venter was playing God, a claim that Venter denied, saying that he could not be modeling himself on someone he did not believe in. When an interviewer pointed out that some scientists did not rule out belief in God, Venter replied that it was their issue to reconcile, not his, and that for him it was either faith or science. One could not have both. Of course, many scientists have had long and distinguished careers while maintaining their belief in God, and indeed, uh, <clears throat> Isaac Newton for one, and indeed many of the fundamentals of a variety of scientific disciplines were put in place by just such people. I often smile when discussing Venter's creation of Cynthia as I see this as a great example of intelligent design, albeit a much less complex derivative of the original version. He just created the DNA, not the whole cell. In an interview for the King's Review magazine, the eminent scientist Sidney Brenner commented about his experience as a scientist in the early days of the mid-20th century, a time of unparalleled fundamental biological discoveries. He worked at Cambridge with pioneering innovators such as Max Perutz, 
Francis Crick, and Fred Sanger, all of whom became Nobel laureates. And Sanger will come back in another time. Um, what people don't realize is that at the beginning it was just a handful of people who saw the light, if I can put it that way. So it was like belonging to an evangelical sect because there were so few of us and all the other sort of thought that there was something wrong with us. They weren't willing to believe. Of course they just said, well, what you're doing, trying to do is impossible. I remember when going to London to talk at meetings, people used to ask me what I am going to do in London and I used to tell them I'm going to preach to the heathens. So the message of true scientific innovation is often treated with ridicule by one's peers and it takes a special type of person to persevere and ultimately win the day. Without this unified and determined focus, the dis discipline of molecular biology would not have been born when it was. Brenner went on in this interview to say, I think that being in science is the most incredible experience to have and I now spend quite a lot of my time trying to help the younger people in science to enjoy it and not feel that they are part of some gigantic machine, which a lot of people feel today. Interesting to ask why. In the following sections, we will consider some of the reasons why young scientists feel that way. The typical path followed by a career scientist. After graduating from high school, a young person wishing to pursue a career in science will carefully choose an undergraduate degree course in their area of interest, usually in a university with a good reputation in that discipline. After a number of years, usually between three and five, they will emerge with an undergraduate degree in their chosen subject. Three years is unusual. Um, the potential career pathways that can be followed at this stage are varied. Graduates may leave university at this point and enter the job market directly, especially if their qualification is vocational. Um, then some become high school teachers and they get postgraduate teaching qualifications, a master's program and a PhD program. And at that point, some of them split off to industry. Many in, in industries require scientists. These relatively well-paying jobs are favored by many who are worried by the often sizable debts incurred to reach this point. For those who remain, who have a passion to pursue a career in academic scientific research, you're now in the top rung of the ladder, well, the top set of rungs anyway, a series of postdoctoral research fellow positions now have to be obtained in order to acquire relevant experience in even more specialized techniques in increasingly specialized areas of research. The competition for those, these positions is even more intense than for those already described. To obtain the requisite positions, candidates may have to travel extensively with associated costs of relocation, etc. In the United States, you might go to England or to Germany or who knows where. After successful completion of an average of two such positions with associated appropriate academic outputs, the aspiring research scientists now in their mid-30s will be in a position to apply for the uh, even rarer tenured or tenure track academic jobs for which competition is fierce. At this career stage, the candidates will have been studying or working on small incomes for an average of 15 years and this takes its toll on many of them not the least in their social and personal lives. For the few who obtained tenured or tenure track positions, while many battles have been fought and won, the war is not over yet. These positions invariably have uh, periods of probation of sometimes three years duration, after which the relative security of tenure will be achieved, subject to a satisfactory performance as judged by faculty and or university administration. Such performance indicators may include quality of research grant income, number and quality of research publications, and assessment by the undergraduate students they have taught. In fact, in many institutions, established academics are subjected to regular performance assessments, the results of which may determine salary increments, progression to higher grades, and in some instances, maintaining uh, positions per se, although I thought that was what tenure was supposed to protect against. It is thus not surprising that after undergoing such stringent selection procedures, those who emerge at the end of the process are highly talented, highly motivated, determined individuals. However, they are thus for the most part highly unlikely to do anything that would serve to create dissent or engender disfavor within their respective university or scientific establishments for the not unreasonable fear of losing all that they have strived to obtain. Although tenure sometimes does work witness Michael Behe. 
The common view that scientists are free thinkers who are open to all new ideas and can pursue such without hindrance is not what occurs in reality. And the following sections give some insights into how controls occur in internal university appraisal processes, the obtaining of external income for research, the peer-reviewed publication of such results, and how these factors relate to one another the financing of research through externally acquired income. A colleague of mine once said, in response to a question from the dean as to why he was considerably more successful than his peers in obtaining external research income, that he only wrote an application for funding when he had a good and novel idea. This would probably be the general impression of the public, uh, but, it is apparently, but it is apparent rather than real. It may come as a surprise to many, that the topics of scientific research are actually not chosen by the applying scientists, but rather by the funders themselves. He who pays the piper calls the tune. These research themes and special initiatives are driven largely by economic and political agendas and are not curiosity driven by the scientists themselves, hence the drive towards applied research and away from individual curiosity-inspired questions. While this situation could be deemed a logical path in the maximizing of research efforts for economic benefits, especially considering that much of the research depends on public funds, it actually serves to prevent innovators from pursuing projects that would be considered unconventional, and this is exactly where true innovative discoveries most often arise. External income from university research comes from a multitude of sources. The major sources of external income for specific research projects tend to be government, charities, and industry. Each source works in different ways with different agendas. The funding from government sources, and they give details about the charities and the industry as well. I'm going to skip over those. Um, while various sources of external research income are very important to the research machine, the most favored and predominant are those from government sources. There are several reasons for this, including the fact that it is most, the most highly competitive source, but also that such grants often cover full economic co uh, costs of the research for the university administration. Sorry. Um, the highly competitive nature of acquiring such funding, often no more than 10% of applications are successful, is commonly used by administrators as an index of the quality of the applicant's research which can have promotion implications. And of course, these grants oil the bureaucratic machine. For these reasons, scientists are encouraged to apply to such sources as a top priority. A well-written application may take several months to write, and with a low level of potential success, it places a considerable burden on researchers. Can one imagine a recently established researcher writing an application which challenges accepted dogma, or which proposes a new idea, bearing in mind that those who make the final decisions on funding have built careers on establishing an established dogma and may even be the authors of such. An eminent colleague of mine with a good track record in research funding, while addressing a group of newly recruited scientists, was asked what the difference is between a successful and an unsuccessful application. Good question. He replied that, he could not answer that question as, in his opinion, he had written superb applications that had not been funded and others that he thought less highly of that were funded. Sir Harry Croteau, 1996 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry for the discovery of carbon-60 in an interview with a Guardian newspaper, oh, by the way, that's uh, a buckyballs in case you're interested. Um, you hear through the grapevine that you're in the running for the prize. But on the day, I forgot all about it and went to the pub for lunch. The timing had a nice irony for only hours before, causing huge embar embarrassment, uh, eventually, I suppose, for the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council in the UK. He had been refused a 1,000 pound grant for research into exactly the same subject. Oops, I got a Nobel Prize for it. Well, whatever. Sidney Brenner describes the current situation in turning research funding in his own inimitable style. Even God wouldn't get a grant today because somebody on the committee would say, oh, those are very interesting experiments, creating the universe, but they've never been repeated. And then someone else would say, yes, and he did it a long time ago, and what's he done recently? And a third would say, to top it all, he published it all in an unrefereed journal, that is, the Bible. 
I saw a whole list of those one time, including he destroyed uh, uh, his subjects when the experiment went bad, <laughs> drowned them all. <laughs> so to summarize, the system of training and employing young, young scientists required many years, as many as 15, of hard work and monetary investment in a highly competitive environment. The end point of this effort is a tenured or tenure track position as a university academic, but the selection process does not end here. The acquisition of external research income is a major factor in dis establishing tenure and is used by administrators in deciding on career progression, often through rigorous annual appraisal procedures. And what do they appraise? Achieving success in this arena largely precludes the high risk of proposing new ideas and applications, and most scientists adopt the incremental approach to research which does not attack or question established thinking. So much for the popular public view that academic research scientists are unrestrained free thinkers. The peer-reviewed proce publication process. The peer-reviewed publication process can be defined as the review of a scientific manuscript by a small number of scientists working in the same field as the subject matter as the submitted work, ob objectively assessing its quality. Most scientists would question the objectivity of this process but the general feeling is that it is the best we have in the absence of, a, of an alternative. As somebody who understands the subject is reviewing the paper, yeah. But is it really good enough in the 21st century to have a subjective system which has endemic bias and which can effectively undermine the dissemination of new information and ideas and can influence the careers of academics in an unfair and unregulated manner? In a tribute to his colleague, Fred Sanger, Nobel Prize is in chemistry, 1958 and 1980. There's this double Nobel Prize. Published in Science, Sidney Brenner wrote, A Fred Sanger would not survive today's world of science. With continuous reporting and appraisal, some committee would note that he published little of import between insulin, which he discovered in 1952, and his first paper on RNA sequencing in 1967, with another long gap until the DNA sequencing in 1977. So two out of his three projects were Nobel Prize winners, but, you know, not really, he would be labeled as unproductive, and his modest personal support would be denied. We no longer have a culture that allows individuals to bark on, embark on long-term and what would be considered today ris extremely risky projects. Interestingly, in, another, in a similar vein, Peter Higgs, who won a... Nobel Prize, more recently, for a prediction of the boson which bears his name, said in an interview in the Guardian newspaper that he doubts a similar breakthrough could be achieved in today's academic culture because of the expectations on academics to collaborate and keep churning out papers. He went on to say that it's difficult to imagine how I would ever have enough peace and quiet in the present sort of climate to do what I did in 1964. Such immense figures in science are not wrong in their assertions, and there are few career scientists in the academic world today who would disagree with these sentiments. Maybe one of the reasons why so many Nobel Prize winning scientists are critical of the subjectivity of the peer review system is that in their early careers, papers describing their initial award-winning discoveries were rejected by their peers. These rejected laureates, and there's a whole list of them, and I'm just going to pick out two of them, Eugene Wigner uh, and Murray Gell-Mann, both of them in physics. Uh, but there are 27 papers they list, and the journals rejecting their papers include Nature, Physical Review, Journal of Biological Chemistry, Journal of American Chemical Society, Journal of Organic Chemistry, Chemical Reviews, Physical Review Letters, Journal of Chemical Physics, Science, Analytical Biochemistry, Applied Physics Letters, and Journal of Clinical Investigation, the latter being a medical one, of course. Um, so you can get rejected by anybody, even for Nobel Prize winning uh, research. As can be seen from that list, the rejection of papers by well-known and highly respected scientific journals is not discipline specific. There has thus been a most fundamental and dramatic climate change in ap academic science over the past decades one of such a magnitude and severity that the innovators in our global society are finding it hard to flourish or even just survive. How has this happened and why have we let it happen? 
One of the most obvious reasons for this lies in the commercialization of academic institutions. Few academics would deny that institutions cannot run at a loss, but the drive today is to maximize profits. To this end, the bureaucracy within universities has mushroomed, and the old view of administrators as support staff for academics has now been effectively reversed. Many academics now re regard themselves as no more than cash cows for a burgeoning administration who top slice research grants for their own needs and who, having been given the powers to do so, set the agendas for academic appraisals, including sums to be obtained externally for each academic grade. You've got to get your grants number of, po of postgraduate students to be supervised, and number of and quality of peer-reviewed articles to be published. And quality and how is the a academic, a bureaucratic uh, person to judge what is quality. Sidney Brenner said of peer review, and of course all, all academics say we've got to have peer review. But I don't believe in peer review because I think it's very distorted, and as I've said, it's simply a regression to the mean. I think peer review is hindering science. In fact, I think it has become a completely corrupt system. It's corrupt in many ways in that scientists and academics have handed over to the editors of these journals the ability to make judgments on science and scientists. There are universities in America, and I've heard from many committees, that won't consider people's publications in low-impact factor journals. Now, I mean people are trying to do something, but I th think it's not publish or perish. It's publish in the okay places or perish. And this has assembled a most ridiculous group of people. I wrote a column for many years in the 90s in a journal called Current Biology. In one article, Hard Cases, I campaigned against this culture because I think it is not only bad, it's corrupt. In other words, it puts the judgment in the hands of people who really have no reason to exercise judgment at all, or at least exercise good judgment, apparently. Uh, and that's been done in the aid of commerce because there are now giant organizations making money out of it. Skipping over a paragraph, high impact factor journals. This is how you figure it out. Impact factors for scientific journals are a relatively recent arrival in the publishing scene and provide the administrators and academic institutions with a numeric score for the quality of a given publication. Or do they? Such factors result from assessing a range of parameters such as the number of citations and the time decay rates of citations, but they are mean values given to journals, not for individual articles in the journals. So two papers published in the same journal may have radically different individual scores. The scenario has indeed occurred where an individual paper in a high impact journal may have a lower impact score than a, patient, a paper published in a lower impact journal. Unfortunately, impact factors are now widely used in university bureaucracies as a metric of the worth and reputation of the academic output of individual scientists, which brings an observation of Albert Einstein to mind. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And the ellipses are, should be mine, and I missed that. Uh, peer review. The definition of peer review previously given would seem quite reasonable to most people. Review of a scientific manuscript by a small number of scientists working in the same field as the subject matter of the submitted work, objectively assessing its quality. However, for some journals, this does not happen, as decisions on whether to publish are often made by an editor or sub-editor, with rejection letters usually contained containing phrases referring to their large number of submissions, lack of space in their journal, and a suggestion that one send the manuscript to a more specialized journal, all of which were kind of true. Most often, however, upon submission, authors are requested to name several potential reviewers and sometimes to name individuals that one would not wish to review the paper, and then the editor reserves the right to use some or all of the suggestive reviewers to, or to choose their own. Most commonly, editors will use a minimum of three reviewers for each submission. In the world of professional scientists, just as in any other sphere of life, there are people one can get along with and others one cannot, so authors would tend to choose their friendly colleagues as reviewers and not their known professional rivals. However, sometimes uh, one, most of one's peers in a given area of scientific research are one's rivals, especially if they are within the same academic system or country and are competing for the same funds for similar research. Can such peers really be totally objective in assessing a rival's application? Over many years of publishing scientific papers, a 
productive author can develop skills in identifying the sources of reviews by using a number of clues in writing style and word usage. Sometimes such reviews contain clearly subjective statements in the equally clear absence of objective points, indicating a reviewer's obvious reluctance to see the submission published. Editorial decisions to accept or reject a submitted paper following a review will take into account the consensus among the three reviewers used or when contentious, the editor may use additional reviewers or make a decision personally. However, one often sees reviews written by individuals who obviously are not familiar with the subject matter or who make statements that are factually incorrect. Uh, skipping a little bit. Critics of non-mainstream robust scientific findings often cite the fact that these have not been subjected to peer review publication, but surely it is clear that this argument is facile. Many of the so-called modern gurus of science disseminate their own, their often outrageous and untested pseudoscientific dogma in the popular press, and it is becoming increasingly obvious that the public are unwillingly, unwittingly influenced by such, believing this to be authentic scientific fact. On the other hand, the current system of peer review, both in funding for research and in publication of papers, is highly focused on maintaining the status quo and is often highly dismissive of genuine ideas and novel findings. This has been and continues to be the experience of many innovative scientists, including most Nobel laureates. Note again our long list of rejected laureates. Although it is clear that the peer review process is highly subjective in many aspects, many authors have wondered whether actual bias exists in the process. The answer is yes, with elements of both sexism and nepotism having been found. There's strong evidence of bias against women applicants in the awarding of research grants, as well as a bias towards favorable outcomes for submissions based on well-known authors in the author list and or the level of prestige of the institutions in which the research was performed. There may also be bias depending on the country in which the research has been performed and on whether the paper contains negative results which either relate to a new study or demonstrate a failure to replicate a study that has been previously published, especially in the same journal. The more sinister side to the process is that reviewers may steal the submitting author's ideas to present them as their own at a later date and or may delay publication if their own research group is working on the same or similar questions. In more recent years, the trend in scientific publishing has gravitated towards so-called open access, driven initially by a desire for public purse funding agencies to see the results of their funded research being made available to the general public, which is a good thing. This aspiration on the face of it is good, but it comes at a substantial cost. Most such funding agencies provide finance for opening access, open access publishing because it costs you to put the, the results in the paper uh, or in the, in the journal. Or if not, this is supplied by special funds in universities. The cost of this process to funding donors or universities hosts and the profits to be made by publishers are not trivial. And there has thus been a veritable explosion in the numbers of open access journals and of established journals which, are now, which now offer such an alternative service, PLOS One being one of the more prominent ones. Uh, the peer review process occurs much as before, but the, uh, the approach to this has become somewhat soft-handed because after all, they get money if they publish it. Um, with the academic reviewers often not being specialists in the subject matter, but still receiving little remuneration for their professional input. And uh, I have a little experience in that. Uh, a second alarming factor arising from soft-handed review procedures is an increase in the likelihood of publication of fraudulent, misinterpreted, or selective data, which cannot be replicated by the interested reader. In a featured article in The New Scientist, Sonia Van Gilder Cook wrote, Listening to When I'm 64 by the Beatles can make you younger. This miraculous effect, dubbed chronological rejuvenation, was revealed in the journal Psychological Science in 2011. It wasn't a hoax, but you'd be right to be suspicious. The aim was to show how easy it is to generate statistical evidence for pretty much anything simply by picking and choosing methods and data in ways that researchers do every day. In other words, you cherry-pick the data. 
Uh, the paper caused a stir among psychologists and has become the most cited in the journal's history. Wow. So everybody else agrees with it. Um, the following year, Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman stoked the fire with an open email to social psychologists warning of a train wreck if they didn't clean up their act. But things only came to a head last year with the publication of a paper in Science. It described a major effort to replicate 100 psychology experiments published in top journals. The success rate was little more than a third. In fact, uh, people began to talk of a uh, crisis in psychology. In fact, the problem extends far beyond psychology. Dubious reports are alarmingly common in many fields of science. Worryingly, they seem to be especially shaky in areas that have a direct bearing on human well-being, the science underpinning everyday political, economic, and healthcare decisions. No wonder the whistleblowers are urgently trying to investigate why it's happening, how big the problem is, and what can be done to fix it. Fiona Goodley, Godley continued in a study of peer review that it does not do well at, at detecting innovative research or filtering out fraudulent, plagiarized, or redundant publication. And that is unfortunately true. Perhaps the most disturbing conclusion was that the process often fails in detecting the innovative. In his conclusion to an article entitled Peer Review, A Flawed Process at the Heart of Science in Journals, published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, Richard Smith, Chief Executive of United Health Europe, said, stated, so peer review is a flawed process full of easily identified defects with little evidence that it works. Nevertheless, it is likely to remain central to science in journals because there is no obvious alternative and science, scientists and editors have a continuing belief in peer review. How odd that science should be rooted in belief. Summary and closing thoughts. Science is widely regarded as a totally objective means of establishing a contemporary worldview as an alternative to the faith-based worldview described in the Bible. Put simply, science often claims that so-called scientific facts produce a superior interpretation of the reasons for the existence of the universe and its component subatomic particles and for the appearance of life and its component biomolecules and its gradual evolution into multiple and diverse forms. However, science is not omniscient and it is subject to regular and often dramatic revelations that concepts once regarded as absolute truth are not. The origins of the universe and of life itself have not been proven scientifically and still today represent major unanswered questions, although this reality is not often stated, often not stated, in open debate or indeed in science textbooks. So many of the fundamental dogmas associated with scientism are held by faith, or to use a more appropriate scientific term, speculation. The so-called scientific dogma pertaining to the origins of the universe and of life do not in themselves fulfill one of the essential attributes of the scientific process, that is, having firm and testable evidence. Anything less is thus a faith-based system, which may come as a revelation to many. A second revelation we have seen is that science itself and virtually all its component machinery is subject to bias. Young aspiring research scientists have to undergo a long period of study and training and, and may, if fortunate, secure a tenure to tenure track position in their early to mid 30s, having invested much time and financial resources and often having personal and social commitments that can affect the objectivity of their work. Under such circumstances, they may have little interest in challenging the scientific establishment. In times past, once a tenured position was secured, the researcher was essentially free to pursue new ideas that would challenge accepted dogma without fear of dismissal. But in more recent times, this contractual provision has all but vanished from academia. In many institutions, academics are now subjected to regular appraisals by the administration to evaluate their progress through analysis of key performance indicators, and failure to meet such arbitrary criteria can result in failure to progress through the salary scales and obtain promotions, and can ultimately result in dismissal from employment in one's chosen field. Skipping the, la the next paragraph, career research scientists have thus had to uh, thus have to abide by certain rules of engagement if they wish to be successful in this highly competitive environment. And challenging ex establishment dogma, dogma on practices in their respective chosen fields would be detrimental to smooth and rapid advancement. 
This is one of the main reasons why many of them remain silent or guarded in their speech and writing during their employment, choosing to toe the party line. However, upon retirement and or after a major award such as a Nobel Prize, many scientists are free to speak openly about the state of bias and the problems in science, as is in the case with some of the authors cited in this chapter. Perhaps this chapter can be best summarized by an article written by Lee Smullen, published in Physics Today and entitled Why No New Einstein, in which he analyzes the position of innovative and independent thinking scientists in what he calls the hostile environment which they currently inhabit. He writes, those who follow well, large, well-supported research programs have lots of powerful senior scientists to promote their careers. Those who invent their own research programs usually lack such support and uh, hence are often undervalued and underappreciated. People with the uncanny ability to ask new questions or to recognize unexamined assumptions or who are able to take ideas from one field and apply them to another are often at a disadvantage when the goal is to hire the best person in a given well-established area. In the present system, scientists feel lots of pressure to follow established research programs led by powerful senior scientists. Those who choose to follow their own programs and under understand that their career prospects will be harmed. That there are still those with the courage to go their own way is underappreciated. It is easy to write many papers when you continue to apply well-understood techniques. People who develop their own ideas have to work harder for each result because they are simultaneously developing new ideas and the techniques to explore them. Hence, they often publish fewer papers, and their papers are cited less frequently than those that, that contribute to something hundreds of people are doing. It is thus evident that the current system of funding, review, and publication of scientific research, rather than facilitating those with brilliant, innovative, and questioning minds, served uh, to make their work more difficult and demanding than that of their compliant peers. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why the current research literature is composed predominantly of incremental studies on previously revolutionary scientific discoveries and not with those of a game-changing nature. In view of the fact that scientific research currently receives considerably more funding than at any time in human history, the scientific establishment urgently requires a revolution in its operational practice practices to eliminate the numerous points in its procedures at which bias in all its forms takes place. It is not good enough for the establishment to say that the systems of academic appointments, promotions, evaluations, and peer review of grants and publications are flawed, but are the best that we have. It is also unacceptable that research themes and funding initiatives should be set by politicians and administrators, and that what appears in published forms should be the final decision of journal editors. Science agendas need to be set by scientists themselves, and freedom of thought and the generation of diverse ideas should be the main drivers in these processes. To paraphrase Albert Einstein, the problems we face today cannot be solved by the minds that created them. Now, my take on it, I think Cha does make a good point. Science subconsciously enforces conformity, sometimes consciously, in the educational system, in the funding system, and in the publication system. It should not be taken as objective, at least the current scientific consensus, and challenges to theological and philosophical ideas should not be immediately settled in favor of the current scientific consensus. I think that this is the point of the chapter and why it was included in the book. Uh, one may add to that point of 53 groundbreaking studies in cancer research, 47 could not be reproduced by Amgen researchers. Some of you may remember that. Shaw's con conclusion is surprisingly soft-pedaled. Uh, doesn't really give you where we go from here, except, well, the scientists should be allowed to publish, I guess. The problem of specific bias against intelligent design is even more to the point of the thesis of the book. Yeah, science is flawed, but it's flawed specifically in this area. Steve Meyer's paper in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington was formally retracted by the Council of the Biological Society of Washington. You think about what that means. And it was retracted not because of any factual errors. They didn't like where he was going. Uh, those of you who want to look it up, um, there's a reference. And uh, there's a note under Stephen C. Meyer at Wikipedia, which is really interesting to read in this regard. 
Another plea often articulated by ID proponents is the idea that there is a community of ID scientists undergoing persecution by the scientific sta science establishment for their revolutionary scientific ideas. A search through PubMed fails to find evidence of their scholarship within the peer-reviewed scientific literature. In the original wedge document, a key part of the plan to displace evolutionary biology was a program of experimental science and publication of the results. That step has evidently been skipped. Nice criticism, except that when you take Meyer's paper out of the literature, now you can't find it. Well, surprise. Um, by the way, the, uh, that a comment was lifted from, uh, with attribution, um, a paper defending science education against intelligent design, a call to action, which doesn't sound like a, an unbiased uh, evaluation of what's going on. And of interest, uh, a couple of authors here, Elliot Sober and Ronald L. Numbers, just of interest. And if you want to, uh, there's where the article is found. Now, the Chinese article on the hand deserves mention in this uh, regard. Those of you who've been here long enough may remember that. Uh, the original article is Biomechanical Characteristics of Hand Coordination and Grasping Activities of Daily Living. Got into PLOS One, apparently passed peer review, and then they discovered that it referenced the creator. And they went bananas. And those of you uh, who haven't been here can look it up on the uh, on that second reference in YouTube. And uh, there's a there's another reference uh, in the Independent, uh, which gives some fascinating uh, comments. It is true that science is biased, but it is even more true that science is biased against intelligent design. In that case, taking such biased science as the best approximation of reality in the area of intelligent design is nonsensical. The chapter laments the present system, but does not give a good solution. Now, there is not a perfect solution, and there may not be a good solution or a good enough solution, but I would say that the best attempt so far at a good solution is the establishment of ID-friendly journals, such as Biocomplexity, and ID-friendly books. Um, and uh, I might say, for creationists, I think Origins has been a really great blessing. Um, it helps to partially correct the imbalance that's found in scientific journals. Um, this chapter that we've just been discussing applies to both sides of the book Scientific Critique, both the uh, uh, question of design in nature per se and in the question of the origin of man. And I think it functions as a good transition to the philosophical critique, which is coming next. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, uh, Ariel. It seems to me that uh, basically here, when you have a peer review system, you have kind of a built-in system for perpetuating a paradigm. Of course you do. And this is recognized not just by intelligent design people, it's recognized by scientists across the board. And uh, if you want to get stuck with ideas, that's the way to go. If you want to discover something new uh, and so on, it's not the way to go, of course. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I don't know what the solution is. Of course, uh, there is some, uh, of course, some trends towards independent publishing, but uh, peer review carries uh, quite a bit of clout, and uh, we're stuck in a system that is biased. Yeah, 
By the way, it's not totally bleak. Um, uh, for example, Michael B. He has um, been able to get a few uh, peer-reviewed papers in uh, into the system. Yes, the lower echelons of the system, but it is technically in the system. Uh, biocomplexity is not the only thing, um, and I I think that even if you have a biased system it's probably worth trying to see what you can do to work uh, through it as well as go around it. Uh, comment over here and then uh, down. This sort of reminds me of the experience that uh, early Adventists went through, notably Ellen White, in breaking loose from the establishments of other religions. And uh, they had to set up separate publishing organizations, the Review and Herald and Signs of the Times, in order to get published. And, uh, of course, once they set it up, and they, they realized they did, uh, they put a lot of energy and effort and a lot of marketing skills into setting up those publishing houses and look where we are today. Well, now, just uh, by the way, the Review and Herald certainly isn't what it used to be and none of these publications are. But my point is that uh, even in, in other fields other than science, certainly other uh, publishing, if you really want to if you really want to break loose with innovative designs or ideas, such as uh, in science or religion, you will have to get your own publication and uh, yeah. not resort and not expect to uh, be as affected by others. I have another point I'd like to make, or a question, rather. I noted that in uh, all of these... these uh, statements that were made and that you quoted, that uh, somehow the final authority seemed to be the Nobel Prize. And yes. uh, we wonder, of course, the Nobel Prize laureates were then free, once they got the Nobel Prize, to critique the system, and uh, they routinely do, apparently, according to what you have cited. And one wonders just what makes the Nobel Prize so free from all of this bias. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, it's not. And that was one of the more interesting things that the, uh, that the uh, major inventor of MRI imaging was a creationist and was denied uh, a Nobel Prize because... Specifically, they didn't want to give him a platform. Even the Nobel Prize Committee. Even the Nobel Prize Committee. Although they seem to be more objective, except the ones, some of the peace prizes that have been awarded have been <laughs> open to question and even laughter. But in science, it seems to be more objective. Uh, it, they try. But like I say, even there, if you... If you are an open creationist, uh, you're, uh, the uh, one particular person who made a major advance was denied specifically on the basis of his creationism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I still remember uh, uh, that Jesus got the same criticism of any of the scribes and Pharisees believed in him. And so I would say that uh, although it's not something that one would want to desire deliberately, um, it, uh, not being recognized by the establishment does not appear to be a complete uh, uh, a negation of the value of one's work. Good point. Okay, we've got a comment here. 
I uh, have a bunch of comments about this, probably just because uh, I have extensive experience with uh, peer reviewing and being part of my profession as uh, doing professional peer review. Um, as a practicing engineer, all of our work is peer reviewed. All work has to go through a building department, somebody who has to review it and approve it. And so in some ways, I, I've, you know, by just practical aspects, you have, you have a lot of experience with this. And I've noticed also I've done peer review on the academic side of uh, conferences and stuff, you know, for engineering conferences and things. And I've noticed that there's some differences that uh, kind of show up in the way that the author has written this is is very clear that he he's he's done a good job of of summarizing how the academic side of things works. And the one comment I would say is that on the practical side, when you're peer reviewing something that has to be built and constructed, and then you basically get feedback if it doesn't work. Basically, if, if I let something go through and then they build it and then it fails, you, you get a feedback loop there. Yes. Whereas if I go through some scientific publication and I publish something that, you know, is the loop something... may take 50 or 100 years to close. Right, exactly. Like, like all these things where they cited somebody went to replicate the research and then all of a sudden they, they didn't, they couldn't replicate it, but that is very rare. Um, but the one thing I would note is like when I was reviewing a bunch of papers that were submitted recently for the main national conference on geotechnical engineering, a lot of the stuff that was submitted, it was pretty junky. It, it wasn't good. About half the papers I had to recommend to be rejected because they were just so poor. And then there's other papers that were quite well written, and even there, you know, you provide suggestions, et cetera, et cetera, for the authors. But there's definitely no way that I see to get around having some review to you know, eliminate some of the junk and at least guide people in, into the way that, you know, things that should be asked and questions that need to be put together to be able to provide something that the public could, or other scientists could follow. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing I would mention is that on the professional side, as, as like I mentioned, as an engineer, when I review something that somebody else has submitted, because company I work for, we have a contract with one of the local cities to provide that peer review. That's all open, basically. I submit a letter to the applicant who's provided the, the report or plans, and they know exactly who I am, and they know all the questions I'm asking, and then, you know, there's formal back and forth with it until, you know, we come to an agreement. And then that reverse works the same way. When I submit something to a different city, you know, and then they have a other reviewer who's similarly practicing like I am, you know, there's a formal back and forth. So <laughs> in some ways, I can see that we could have our own biases, but at least we know what our biases are, what those person's biases are, you know, and then you got to work within that system. But again, it's, it's, it provides that feedback that you don't get with the more anonymous part of the reviews. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, there's an argument that if you, if you put the reviewer up, that the reviewer won't be as frank as, as if uh, the reviewer is anonymous. Yeah, that, that could be true. I definitely could see that. It, it's a difficult problem. It is, but it also, when you're open about who you are and, and your biases, in some ways, that at least provides the other side with. And, you know, we run this all the time where there are some reviewers who are just really hard to get 
through. You know, there are certain cities where it's very difficult to get your work approved because those reviewers are very difficult to work with. And some of them are folks who don't do as much practice and they do almost all review work. And so the practicalities don't always come through. You know, whereas other people who are more practicing and only do a little bit of review stuff, sometimes yeah. it's easier to work from. But as far as the wider scientific you know, publication, <clears throat> when you're doing those practical reviews like that, it's not like you just can reject it and then walk away from it. You know, that thing is going to come back and forth because whoever wants to build on that particular thing is going to, you know, yeah. they're going to keep at it until that stuff issue is resolved. Whereas here in, in the scientific journals, it seems like, and I've noticed that in some of the engineering journals, they have, they brag about how much they reject. You know, <laughs> the top journal rejects 80, 90 percent of the articles. Yeah. Right? Right. Whereas, yeah, exactly. But that's really not the purpose of science. The purpose of science should be to, you know, a journal or publication should be to disseminate as much information as possible within the limits of having something that's, you know, decently um, communicated to the community. Yeah. Comment here and then one back there. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, if you are a journal and you want some respect, you can't just publish anything. You can't uh, you uh, accept anything just because it's a new ID or uh, and so on. And uh, a lot of we use the term crackpot writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I might say in the area of origins, we are not uh, completely free of those. Uh, so you you do need this process. It seems to me that uh, the peer review system could profit from uh, a more rigorous and careful selection of the peers than it does. Uh, you know, an author can list, well, half a dozen uh, reviewers for his article and so on. Uh, uh, th this kind of is not objective. It's your friends uh, or those who know you and so on. Uh, uh, it seems to me a little more rigor there uh, uh, would would help. And uh, but you still have to do some reviewing. Reviewing is essential if you're going to maintain uh, your reputation or your journal. Yeah, the, the, the real question is where do you go from there? Okay, go ahead and then... Uh, okay, go ahead. I can wait. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's very clear that um, somebody holds the monopole on knowledge. What's right, <laughs> what's wrong on the specifically intelligent design? So is it that uh, Academy of Science uh, is one of America that, that holds that kind of kind of control, monopole? Monopoly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they would like to. Fortunately, it's not a complete monopoly. But uh, but they will throw what, how much weight they do have around on that. So that's that's not the like scientific way to to let the science being uh, developed to come to the truth. No, uh, the the important thing is that. When one realizes that there is a bias, then one has to account for it. And that means that even an august society like the American Academy for the Advancement of Science uh, should not hold a monopoly on uh, 
the ability to say anything in a scientific journal. And that's probably the, the it's actually a difficult problem because you don't want just anybody who writes something to, to publish in your journal. You'd like to have at least some semblance of, of a review. So you get an editor, okay? Well, already you have the possibility of bias there if the editor is biased. Then you get reviewers, and now you have the possibility of reviewers being biased. And now the next thing, the next thing, the next question is, who should the reviewers be? Well, you know, if you're dealing with molecular biology, you really don't want a mechanical engineer doing the review, you know, let alone a, a housewife or a, you know, I mean, you want somebody who's in the general field who can kind of understand what the arguments are. But one of the, uh, one of the things that happens with peer review is that if the general article is something that people like, They'll look at it and say, you know, that data makes sense. And the conclusions make sense given the data. And I think I'll pass it. If, on the other hand, you're going, I don't like the conclusions. I really don't like the conclusions. There must be something wrong with the data. And now I'm going to pick into it as pickily as I can to try to get rid of it. Um, and, uh, I mean, I... I had an article once that I published that uh, was on senile dementia and diet. And uh, we had proposed that there was a possibility uh, that animal products might have some kind of a, an effect on it. And so we went to test it by you know, seeing whether people who ate a lot of animal products had more senile dementia than those who didn't. I mean, that's kind of the logical way to test that. And then when we went to write it, we wrote it as to, you know, here's why we did it. And one reviewer said, well, you need to take that out because that's not proven yet. And, but if you take it out, then, then why do the study at all? Uh, fortunately, the editor uh, felt that our uh, reason for keeping it in was good enough and we were allowed to, uh, to say why we did it. Uh, not saying, and in fact, as as more data has come out, we're probably uh, at least partly incorrect in our thesis. They didn't publish? But they did publish. So you can get stuff through sometimes. But that wasn't terribly controversial. I mean, after all, um, bovine spongiform encephalopathy has, I think was at about this time, uh, was getting... Uh, attention in England and it was started starting to be realized that meat eating could have something to do with senile dementia and uh, and so the conclusions were not shall we say totally politically unmotivated um, uh, but on the other en end of things uh, I, uh, some of you may remember I published a uh, a comment about how the Canaanites uh, were not all destroyed by the Israelites according to the Bible. I got that thing published. The um, people who responded responded in an interesting way. But what struck me is that now I am getting emails from people I have no knowledge of saying, would you like to peer review for our journal? <laughs> and it's a genetics journal. And to be perfectly fair, although I think I do know something about genetics, um, it's not actually a total specialty of mine. And most importantly, the article that I wrote had nothing to do with whether, you know, what the genetics were and had only to do with what the biblical story said mm -hmm. and what history uh, bore out in the case of the destruction of Tyre and Sidon. And so I, uh, you know, that has nothing to do with genetics, uh, and yet they're asking me to referee in a genetics journal because I guess I wrote in one. So, uh, you know, when he starts talking about uh, the peer review being a little more slack, I think he's right. 
uh, that the that the, uh, that the open journals actually aren't as picky, which raises some interesting questions. Of course, then there's the Chinese article that got retracted from an open journal. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, whether whether the peer review and open journals actually facilitates the ability to say something about intelligent design or maybe even re detracts from it because you get the article published and then this public or certain as certain parts of the public descend on you and then uh, suddenly you, the article which had passed through the standard peer review gets retracted. So it's it's an interesting, it's a difficult subject. Uh, and there's even more to be said about uh, uh, funding. And, and uh, uh, well, I'll reserve that for another time, maybe. <laughs> I'll pre preface my remarks with a little personal insight to the challenges I've faced. Nearly six weeks ago, I was... <clears throat> thrown off a bicycle, I think I would prefer saying I should have been thrown off a horse, but I don't do horseback riding. And you're likely to have a much softer landing if you go cross country, if there's lots of good soil, but I landed on hard concrete and hence uh, broke my hip. But that's just a little aside. So I'd miss being here for all of six weeks, and two weeks before then, I was out of town, so it's been over eight yeah. weeks. Good to be back. I wanted to comment something from a comment on the philosophical aspect, and he stuck with publishing, which is down my line as librarianship, my training in librarianship. I will save most of my remarks on the philosophical side, and that's the analysis of isms. Are all isms good or bad? <clears throat> and if, <clears throat> excuse me, if there are some isms that are good, how do you tell good isms from bad? You know, you have humanism, naturalism. The next two uh, titles of the chapters, methodological naturalism. So I'll save my remarks there. Other than I want you to look at 1 Timothy 6.20 in between now and the next two or three weeks. 1 Timothy 6.20 warning against science falsely so-called. And that sounds to me like scientism, which I thought might be the theme today, but we're going to move more in that direction. We are going weeks. to move more in that direction. I've read the book, and it's coming. Uh, <clears throat> I saw it, too, and so <laughs> I'm excited about that part. But I By was, the way, in, in, in Greek, it's gnosis. In Latin, it's scientia. So it is actually how, translated science. Yeah, RSV uh, has knowledge. So is it more than knowledge or is it the application of knowledge in maybe in uh, ways that are not legitimate because it has the word false in front of pseudo. It would be false. Yeah. We can talk about that next time. I was going to say two or three things about publishing since I know something about publishing. My own experience, I have published in a key creationist journal in the last two or three years now, uh, a lengthy article, and I have a second article that's in the process of peer review. So I know something about it, but I don't want to prematurely evaluate the pre peer review process until that gets fully reviewed. I've made it through two or three hoops. Two of the three reviewers are very pleased with it, and with changes, of course, they have. Mm -hmm. But I hear there's one reviewer that's holding back, and I won't say more about that. Hopefully, I'll get published. Um, Dr. Rose's comments here, I think, are very appropriate. Uh, do we throw out the whole peer review process? No, and your comments, too, there. We need it. Uh, engineering, it needs it, but... Uh, some of the soft sciences, in addition to the hard sciences, we need peer review. But the thought occurred to me, to make it really equitable, you almost need peer reviewers of the peer review process. So you need to set up another entity 
that reviews the whole process to make sure it stays on track. And yeah. I, I'm not sure who's going to determine that. But I will say one more thing about peer review process and publishing. Dr. William Shea, retired archaeologist, still alive, uh, biblical archaeologist. He was trained in the medical sciences right here at Loma Linda. He has an MD degree. He went to University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, highly trained to the Ph.D. level there. And I asked him, about the time he was close to retirement, I said, you know, I've been wanting to get stuff published and it's so hard. He said, don't worry. He said, for me, over a lifetime, for every ten articles I submit, nine of the ten go into the trash can. And I thought, here's a brilliant mind who can publish more easily than most of us could, nine out of ten. Then I saw in this chapter 10% of the proposals are rejected. I mean, 90%, 10% are accepted. So there is... There is the challenge. There is yeah. the challenge. And that's all I have to say for today. Comment in the way back. Speaking to motive on why things are rejected, I'm reminded that some years ago I was on a union committee faced with a regional conference building a shopping center to support their education program. A major meeting was held in the union office and the regional conference hired buses and brought busloads of constituents to influence the vote. The constituents got out of hand, they climbed up on tables, they disrupted the whole thing, finally had to be shut down. The Review and Herald put a small article in the Review and Herald magazine about it and the most uh, strongly, strongly used word was vigorous discussion. <laughs> I wrote to the editor and said, why can't you be a little more honest with what actually happened? And the answer was this. God's people are so troubled in this world, they don't want to hear any more troubles in their own publications. <laughs> so we had good motive. I canceled so my So climbing up on tables became a... Uh, a uh, uh, vigorous discussion. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, that's a, yeah, that's um, that's interesting. No, if you think about it, if you're a if you're a department chair, and you're the chair of the Department of Chemistry, let's say. Now, your job is to figure out who of the people are really doing enough to get promoted or to get to continue on well how do you determine that they're good enough if you're lucky you're the department chair and you actually have your own specialty so you have a let's say you're an inorganic chemist well how do you know what the biochemists are really doing and whether they're really doing it well or not well the answer is you don't because it's far enough away from your specialty that you're kind of hanging on by this, you know, skin of your teeth trying to understand it. So what you do is you say, well, somebody else should know. So, well, obviously, if they really know that much, they should be publishing. But then that's obviously not good enough. So you say, well, they should be publishing in the better journals, like Nature, instead of in the uh, journal of the, I don't know, uh, a Northwest Chemical Society, you know. Um, and uh, so that now there has to be impact journals. Well, but you can publish any article in one of those journals and nobody really cares. Uh, is it, you know, if, if you have three citations, it, uh, does that really, have you really influenced the... Uh, and so what these are all doing is trying to substitute other people's judgment for your own. And that's really what's going on here. It's what's going on in terms of employment. It's going on in terms of, of uh, publication uh, because 
people who like the general ideas where you're going are going to judge people less harshly. Uh, you know, if, if you don't like it, you may demand to see the original data because you can't believe it's really true. If you do like it, you know, yeah, it looks good to me. And pure fraud could just slide right on through because nobody really checked. And a really sharp but dishonest person can just make sure that their data doesn't disagree with anybody else's but goes beyond it in some way. Um, and, and everybody is going to go, well, whatever. And in fact, there was a case of a, a, a prolific author. He's 140 uh, articles or something like that before his scam got shut down. And I'm going to say his scam got shut down because when they went to go and look at him, all of the notebooks that were supposed to have the original data were just not there. And in fact, there was an early call where he had written on some obscure subject of um, uh, a hereditary cardiomyopathy and published some really nice data. And somebody else had done the same research. And I don't know whether they published data or not, but they wrote in as a letter to the editor saying, this guy's data disagrees with ours. And they said, we don't understand why. It could be that A, that our, our patient populations are different. It could be, and it listed four things that could account for the differences. Fraud was never mentioned. Um, and so even if you try to replicate studies, it doesn't pick out deliberate fraud. Um, uh, you know, as long as people think, well, it sounds good, they're, they're willing to let you go. But where you have really good data, but it doesn't fit with the paradigm, um, I, had, I had one reviewer of an article I uh, submitted to the uh, American Schools of Oriental Re Research on uh, Leviticus Scroll. And at the end of the article, which I presented a... a uh, orally before, um, there was uh, the one guy, and he uh, one guy took a you know I'm not sure it's ready for publication, but you know this is an interesting idea, and we should check this, and we should check that, and all that. And uh, the other guy said, "This guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's an idiot. He you know," and and he went on to say that even if we had a carbon 14 date on the school, I still wouldn't believe. And at this point, you realize that this guy's criticism is not really based on what objective reality is. It's based on, uh, you know, he, he has a theory and he's, not, he, he's just not letting go of it, period. The evidence is totally irrelevant. Um, and uh, uh, if you have somebody like that as your reviewer, you're going to get a negative review regardless of what you do. And my sense is that much of the time in traditional uh, standard journals that intelligent design is getting that kind of review, that the evidence really doesn't matter. Uh, one comment here, and then uh, uh, maybe uh, we'll... Thanks. Maybe the um, the review process is kind of a, a double-edged sword because it's true it does prevent papers that are friendly to intelligent design from making it through the process. On the other hand, they let through things that are blatantly bias, and is that necessarily a, a bad thing for people that are willing to keep their eyes open? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the, it, you may be right that eventually... Um, it may take a lot of rope, but eventually they may kind of hang themselves in a sense. And it will be evident that what's, 
what we see today is not the result of uh, scientific uh, uh, persuasiveness, but is rather of a uh, of a kind of forced persuasion by ideologues. And I think if people realize that, most people's reaction to that kind of thing is, well, they're just wrong, and I'm not going to let them determine what I think. And um, I think it has something to say about how we how we behave in general. Um, I can understand um, ourselves by being careful about allowing anybody who wants to publish in some of our journals because they uh, otherwise they can drown uh, our voice out as well as you know so that there's no place to turn to to, to hear. The other side of the story, so it's it's reasonable to it, it's reasonable to uh, prefer, uh, and I in other words, I'm not apologizing for uh, Origins mostly publishing creationist stuff, um, but I think that uh, I think that we need to be careful. But in our public pronouncements, uh, not to try to control the ac uh, access to uh, speech so much that um, the other side never gets to say anything. Because I think when we do that, what we do is we turn ourselves into an echo chamber at that point. And I think that's not good. Uh, it's one of the reasons why periodically if there's somebody from the other side who wants to address this uh, audience, I will allow them to do it. Uh, some of our best presentations have been by uh, people like Irvin Taylor. Truth can afford to be fair. To be fair. That is right. Anyway... Tomorrow we get into, f uh, not tomorrow, uh, ne next week, we get into philosophy. Um, and I'll tell you uh, ahead of time that I have a few critiques of the first uh, article. So uh, be prepared to, uh, to uh, uh, read it carefully. Let's just put it that way.